Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6838. Today we're going to continue our consideration of correspondence problems, but our basic task is to lift our consideration from just a pair of shapes at a time to entire collections. The basic idea here is going to be that if I compute pairwise maps between many different shapes, well, now, in addition to finding maps that minimize distortion, I can talk about compositionality. And in particular, I might ask that if I compose maps in a cycle, I get something that looks like the identity matrix. Now, what we're gonna see is that that condition, which we'll call consistency, is a really valuable way to judge a collection of maps between shapes, to regularize map computation tools, and to fix outliers when something has gone wrong. So to get started, basically in our previous discussion, what we've thought about so far uh, are algorithms that map between just one pair of geometric objects. So for example, maybe I have a 3D horse and a 3D donkey, and what I want is to find some bijective mapping phi from the horse into the donkey that preserves geometric textures or maybe keeps semantic information, like maps the ears to the ears and the feet to the feet. But Fundamentally, our universe consists of just two pieces of geometry, that horse and that donkey. So when we construct maps from one shape into another, the types of considerations that we typically include are things like distortion, like does the map stretch out the surface or not, uh, as well as some semantic considerations that come from labeling and so on. But now let's say that we have a whole collection of shapes. So rather than just the horse and the donkey here, suppose that we have a horse, a donkey, a giraffe, a zebra. And now I take one of the mapping tools from our previous lecture, and I can apply it to all these different pairs of shapes. In particular, I could compute a mapping from the horse into the donkey, from the donkey into the giraffe, from the giraffe into the zebra, and then back. And now that I have more than one map, I can do one really important thing, which is composition. So for example, if I compute the map from horse to donkey and the map from donkey into uh, giraffe here, then I actually have a map from horse to giraffe by composition, right? I take the point on the left model, I map it to the middle guy and then to the third one, and effectively I'm just composing those first two arrows. And this leads us to a really interesting and weird idea, which is I can take my mapping tool and I can compose in a cycle. So I can go from horse to donkey to giraffe to zebra, back to horse. And the question is, what do we expect to happen? Well, in some sense, you know, if we ask, what do we expect when we compose maps around a cycle, I would argue in the absence of additional information or structure in our problem, we'd probably expect to get the identity map, right? That is to say, when I map from the horse to itself, unless I have a really good reason, probably I just expect that to be kind of a no-op. But the problem is that most of the mapping tools that we considered in our previous lecture really don't have that property. Um, there's really nothing about those algorithms that we wrote down that would enforce this property that if you compose around a cycle, you should get the identity. In fact, that's a really strong condition on a mapping algorithm and one that's very unlikely to just happen by accident. So that condition has a name, unsurprisingly, it's called cycle consistency. I think it's a pretty reasonable name myself. But basically the idea of cycle consistency is that if I have a collection of maps, and I compose the maps from one object into another, into another, into another, and I eventually get back to the first object that I started with, if no matter how I do that, anytime I make a cycle, I get the identity map, then I say that my collection of maps is cycle consistent. But typically, algorithms for mapping don't have the cycle consistency property with one notable exception. Well, two notable exceptions, I guess. One of the notable exceptions is an algorithm that's specifically designed for consistent mapping. But um, the only time when this tends to happen by accident is when your mapping algorithm always kind of composes through the same shape. So like for instance, some algorithms for brain registration and medical imaging, basically they don't ever map from one brain directly into another, they just map all brains into some template. So if I want to map from brain A to brain B, then I get it by going brain, template, other brain. So in that case, you might get a cycle consistent set of maps only because everything is basically going through one middleman. 
But for most of the mapping algorithms that we talked about in our previous lecture, that's simply not the case. That if I like have a collection of n shapes and I compute n squared maps, maybe n squared minus n because the diagonal is easy. Um, there's no reason why this cycle consistency algorithm should happen um, for, like, for example, blended intrinsic maps or any of the techniques that we, uh, we called out. But at the same time, I think the sort of high-level philosophical point is that there's no good reason why your map shouldn't be consistent. Um, and this is really a philosophical point here in some sense. Like nobody said that your mapping algorithm necessarily has to have this property. But I guess the way that I phrased it on the slide here, which I think is a pretty sensible way to think about consistency as a regularizer for correspondence problems, is that you better have a good reason if your correspondences are not inconsistent. You know, like if your algorithm somehow maps from horse to donkey to giraffe to zebra back to horse and then doesn't give you the identity map, it would be good to know why. And actually, conversely, it turns out that cycle consistency is a pretty weak assumption on a mapping tool, that there's a huge base of cycle consistent maps, and um, there's no reason why you might not want to optimize in this space. Now, that said, over the years, I've had some fun discussions about whether cycle consistency is truly necessary for correspondence tools. And in fact, for those of you who are familiar with advanced differential geometry, you might think of cycle consistency as having some commonalities with curvature. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think you have a homework problem this year that kind of explores this idea that like, one way to understand curvature, um, which is sometimes uh, comes with this term um, holonomy, has to do with taking tangent vectors, like dragging them around in loops, and then noticing that, you know, when I take these local maps of like parallel transport of a tangent space, um, and I compose them onto a loop, I actually don't get the identity, I get something that like rotates up to curvature. And so that would be an example where maps are not consistent and you like would expect it. So I guess like a really abstract way to think about this problem is like, does the space of shapes have curvature <laughs> or holonomy? Um, I don't know, yeah, maybe there's some, some universe where actually you would expect uh, mapping to be cycle inconsistent and that there's actually should be curvature in the space of maps. But this goofy high level mathematical question aside, I think, I think for the most part, we would expect our mapping tools to, to be consistent with themselves. And, and this is a totally reasonable regularizer to put on these problems. But what's gonna be the issue? I think it's totally intuitive to say like, okay, I'm gonna try and take a mapping tool and improve it by making my maps more consistent. So for example, if I know a priori that I'm not just gonna compute a map between this pair of surfaces, I actually know that there's a big data set of surfaces out there. Um, maybe I can actually improve all of the maps mutually by computing them all at once and asking them to be cycle consistent. But from a practical perspective, it's not super obvious how to do that, right? So for instance, here's a three cycle, right? So just map A to B to C back to A. If I want to write down the condition that my maps are cycle consistent, well, the naive way to write it down is what I've given you on this slide here, right? Phi 1 composed with phi 2, composed with phi 3, gives you identity map. And this is a really <laughs> unpleasant constraint to put on an optimization algorithm. I mean, in general, composition doesn't necessarily work all that well. I guess I shouldn't say that anymore, given that neural networks are giant composed functions. But, but for, for geometry style mapping problems, this is, this is a tough constraint to work with. So there's sort of this push-pull between these two ideas, right? One is that naive ways of writing down the cycle consistency constraint look pretty frightening from a mathematical kind of optimization perspective. On the other hand, somehow the more data you have at your disposal, the better you should be able to do on your correspondence problems. You know, like if I have a whole data set of shapes and I want to put them all in correspondence with one another, then somehow doing that in a cycle consistent fashion should improve my maps because I have more information than just pulling two shapes at a time, computing a map, and then forgetting that those shapes exist. Um, so for example, here's kind of a goofy, you know, puzzle <laughs> uh, style problem where there's like lots of pairwise fits between the different puzzle pieces, but there's only one way to put them all together into one coherent picture of the universe. And, and essentially this style of story happens a lot. So the question is, how do we reconcile these two things? On the one hand, it's quite hard to write down cycle consistency as a reasonable constraint, like a, in an optimization problem. On the other hand, somehow we feel like it should only help matters. So where are we left? 
Now, what we're going to do today is have a whole sampling of different methods for consistent correspondence that range in complexity. Everything from some kind of simple heuristics involving computing spanning trees in a set of maps to algorithms that are at least trying to detect when just a few isolated bad maps make cycle consistency particularly bad. And then we're going to conclude with a really cool convex relaxation of the cycle consistent mapping problem that I think is worth working through a little bit as a nice example of a really non-obvious way to think about this kind of problem. Now, since we're getting toward the end of 683A, we're also really reaching the interface of what's known. I think a lot of research remains to be done in making consistent map collections efficiently that minimize distortion, all that good stuff. Um, and I think every year we're going to continue to see some interesting research in this space. So at the broadest level, probably the holy grail of the consistent mapping problem is essentially to give you an entire collection of objects and simultaneously optimize for all the different maps between every pair in a way that's as consistent as possible, also preserves interesting semantic features, maybe there's some machine learning in there, reduces distortion, all in one shot. I would argue this is largely an open problem for a lot of different reasons. I mean, a big shape collection is a lot of data. Um, using that cycle consistency constraint in a coherent and useful way is, is a tricky problem. Um, so typically, we have to resort to some strategies that maybe are a little bit lighter weight than this entire end-to-end -end consistent mapping system. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we also don't even know that for some collections a consistent set of maps even exists. So today we're going to start with a bunch of different formulations and see how they play out in the practice of consistent mapping. So in the simplest formulation, maybe we're not even going to worry about minimized distor distortion, but instead we're going to break our mapping technique into two steps. Now, what's our two-step going to do? Now, in the first step, between we'll have as input n shapes. So this is unlike our previous lecture, where we had two shapes as input, right? the source and the target. Now we have a whole collection of n. And maybe, now this is where we're going to start considering a specific case. Maybe we go ahead and run some piece of software that can compute a map between two shapes, and we call it on every possible pair. So what we get is n squared maps between every pair of shapes in our collection. Then one way to formulate the joint matching problem is to start with those n squared maps and then try to find an approximation of that collection of maps, which is more cycle consistent than the input. Right? Like I run my pairwise mapping tool. There's no guarantee that the pairwise mapping tool gives me cycle consistent maps. So as output, I want to find like the closest projection of my collection of maps onto a cycle consistent set. Now, notice that this is kind of a halfway problem, because really what we should do is like when we compute those n squared maps, we might as well be kind of cognizant of the cycle consistency condition. But for now, we're going to break it into just step one and step two and not worry about the fact that they're deep coupled a little bit. Now, there are many different techniques that go back many years that are essentially solving versions of this problem. So probably the best known one is in the universe of multi-view registration. This is one of these problems that goes back like 30, 40 years. So in multi-view registration, uh, maybe I have this little garden gnome lying on his side. That's what it looks like. Uh, and now, um, what do I do? Well, I have a 3D scanner, and I point it at this garden gnome from different angles. So I walk around it you know, 360 degrees. I take a bunch of scans. And the reason that I do that, instead of only taking one scan, is that each scan adds more information. right? It, captures some of the nooks and crannies in that 3D shape. It captures some camera angles that maybe aren't visible from one to another. And I want to fuse them all together into one coherent 3D model. And that's what this registration problem is. So in multi-view registration, well, I take n of these scans instead of just two. And the basic task here is to put them in coarse bodies. Now, how do I do that? Well, typically, Maybe for every pair of scans, I compute some rigid motion, in this case, from one into another. We don't need the fancy mapping algorithms from our previous lecture, in this case, because the garden gnome can't deform. <laughs> um, but to put everything in the same frame, in essence, I need those maps to be consistent, right? Otherwise, I haven't really done that. And so that was what motivated some of the early algorithms for consistent mapping, was the fact that between every pair of views of this garden gnome, maybe I could register every pair, 
and now I wanted to take all those pairwise registrations and extract one single registration for the whole collection that I was going to use to extract my final 3D shape. So there are many different ways to formulate this problem. One that I think is kind of interesting to study from a computer science perspective is to think of there being kind of an all or nothing phenomenon. So here's the basic idea. Let's say that my mapping algorithm that considers shapes just in pairs either does really well or just fails. <laughs> Right? So either I manage to take a pair of views of this lawn gnome and perfectly register them, like I found the right pairs of points to do that, or I just have garbage. So in this case, a reasonable model looks something like what I'll show you on this slide. Now here's the basic idea. Here I'm showing you a graph where every vertex is kind of like a different view of that, that lawn gnome, and every edge is a mapping then one thing that I can do is compute a spanning tree of that graph. So let's say that I have a spanning tree of this graph. What is that in essence? Well, it's a collection of maps, right? It's a subset of the maps that I computed. So one thing that I can do is think about spanning trees in the following way, which is to say for every spanning tree of this graph of maps between different shapes, essentially what that gives me is a way to register all those shapes together. Hopefully you all see that. The basic point here is that remember, spanning trees have a useful property, which is that there's only one path between every pair of vertices. So what does that mean? Well, if I wanted a map from like the bottom left to the upper right vertex on this uh, graph here, what do I do? I compute the shortest path, or really the only path between those vertices, and I just compose the maps along those paths. And so I get a map from one to the other. And the useful property here is that that map is necessarily consistent because there are no cycles, <laughs> right? Um, so here's an interesting theoretical problem that you can ask, which is, let's say I have a collection of domains and I have pairwise maps between all of them. So, you know, the, I have a graph like this and it's not a tree, like the, that underlying grid that you can see here. Then here's an interesting optimization problem, which is to say, can you find the largest spanning tree that is consistent with the underlying set of maps. So in other words, I have a, a spanning tree, and for every edge that isn't in the spanning tree but is between vertices in that subtree of the graph, that edge is consistent with composing maps along the spanning tree. Now, unfortunately, uh, this goes all the way back to 2002, if not earlier, what was shown is that this problem is NP-hard. It's, it's actually impossible to sort of in some sense, extract the largest collection of consistent maps hiding inside of a graph of pairwise maps. Um, so already what we're, we're starting to learn is that these problems are really, really, really hard <laughs> um, to solve with global optimality. I encourage you guys to read this. I think it's actually a PhD thesis, and, and it's got a lot of nice observations about the uh, consistent mapping problem, which actually predate uh, many of the papers that we'll talk about today. Probably should be acknowledged more. So what these folks uh, recommend at the end of the day is a pretty straightforward heuristic algorithm, um, which you can view kind of similarly to some of the agglomerative clustering algorithms that we've talked about in this course, where essentially what you might do is start with a single view of our shape, and then just keep greedily adding views. So in other words, like, you know, I have some view of my object I'm trying to reconstruct. Now I look at all the other views, and in order to glue one of the other views on here, I find sort of one of the best maps, like one of the best edges in my graph that doesn't, that reaches to a node I haven't seen yet, and I just add it and I do that in a greedy fashion. So if I do that until there are no more vertices to add, then I have some spanning tree, um, and it might be good or it might not. So for example, on the bottom here, they th show three different registrations of this two-dimensional shape, one of which where it succeeded in the middle and two where it didn't, just by building that tree in different ways. Um, so essentially this heuristic algorithm is a little tricky because there's so many different spanning trees of a graph um, and basically a single incorrect map can destroy the entire registration procedure. Hopefully you see that. So like let's say that I'm registering scans of the squirrel so like maybe I have a set of camera views that's kind of rotating around the outside and for whatever reason I just misregister one pair. Well what does that mean? That means like maybe I get the whole left side of the squirrel correct, the whole right side, but then those two get misaligned to one another because I chose one bad map in the collection. 
Um, so these sort of spanning tree based techniques are a little brittle, especially if you only get to choose one. Now just recently there have been some interesting algorithms that sample in the space of spanning trees and I kind of wonder if it's worth revisiting some of the problems that are hiding here. But anyway, these were the early approaches to consistent mapping. The basic idea that I could view one way to obtain a consistent collection of maps is as a spanning tree of my graph where the edges are mapping between pair and if I want to map from A to B, then I compute the path along the spanning tree from A to B and then just compose those maps. So in other words, I just ignore any map that isn't in my spanning tree. And this is cycle consistent by construction, but it often can create some bad correspondences, especially because you're not using the cycles to somehow improve things, you're just throwing them away. So if we jump forward, I think about, what, 10 years here, um, people started thinking about consistency and cycle consistency in many different fashions. And one of the earliest problems that we studied was not necessarily to repair <laughs> mappings, but at least to try and find bad maps in a collection. So here, again, we're going to continue using the same kind of data structure, where we think of our different views as nodes in a graph and our maps as edges between those nodes. I think that's a useful abstraction. And one of the really fun problems that you can solve, which was originally proposed in this 2010 uh, CVPR paper, is to try and detect inconsistent loops. And more or less, to use that to detect bad mappings. So what is an inconsistent loop? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. So I have a big collection of maps, and an inconsistent loop is one where when I map around the loop from an object to itself, I don't end up where I started. And so in this research paper, which was uh, disambiguating visual relations using loop constraints, now here the uh, mappings were between two-dimensional images, but actually the technique itself can apply in any context. I don't think it's really specific to, to photographs. Essentially what we did, or what they did, <laughs> was introduce two sets of variables, XL and XE. Now L stands for loop here, and E stands for edge. And both of them are binary variables. So the basic idea here, maybe I'll should actually uh, write it down, uh, is as follows. So we say that XL is equal to, uh, let's see here. Um, right, so XL is equal to 1 for a bad loop uh, L and 0 otherwise. So the idea here is that I have this variable which is trying to detect like, uh-oh, this, uh, this loop is bad. When I say bad, I really mean inconsistent. And then similarly, we have another variable, xe, um, and xe is going to equal 1 for a bad map e and 0 otherwise. So here's the, the basic point is why is a loop inconsistent? Well, often the reason that a loop is inconsistent is that there's some edge in that loop, like some mapping, where my pairwise mapping tool failed, and that's the mapping I want to throw away. But here's the kind of tricky indirect problem, is that I don't know how to evaluate the quality of any one map. All I could do is compose maps together and see if I get the identity when I compose around a cycle. So here's the basic kind of reasoning that happens in this research paper, which I think makes a lot of sense. The basic idea here is that, well, what makes for a bad loop? Like a bad loop is sort of the same as having at least one um, bad edge. Right, so the idea here is that if I look in a loop of edges in my graph of maps, and there's one edge which is a bad mapping that I want to label that loop as bad. So what does that mean? Well, this condition is exactly the same as saying that XL is greater than or equal to XE for all E in L. Now what is this saying? Now remember that XE is 1 anytime that there's a bad mapping on an edge E. So here I like have a collection of maps from one shape into another. Right, so the XE's are like sitting on the edges and the loop is L here. So the basic point is that, well, this indicator variable which is telling me whether there's a bad loop is greater than or equal to the indicator value from any edge, meaning that 
this binary thing is one if there's any edge that's one inside of that loop. OK. Um, incidentally, uh, we can say one other thing which is kind of useful, which is if all edges are good edges, so in other words, I have a bunch of, of, of useful edges in a loop, um, well, then the loop is good. And here's a kind of funny way to write that, uh, which is to say that xl is less than or equal to the sum over e in l of x e. So here's the basic point. Now if I go around the same loop and every single edge is labeled with a zero, meaning that I'm happy with that edge, that edge is, is not a bad map, then xl had better be zero as well. Right, so I can actually write it this fashion, right? Because when I sum around the loop, in that case, I'll get a zero on the right-hand side. And we're constraining all of our variables between, to be between zero and one, so necessarily xl is zero. Okay? So those are the two basic constraints here. So, so what we do is we draw a bunch of different loops. And we'll call them l in a pre-processing step. So maybe I just start randomly drawing loops in my graph. And for each loop, I compose the maths together, and I write down some number rho l, where rho l is measuring how cycle consistent I am. So I, I like compose my maths into a loop, and then I measure the deviation of that composed loop from the identity matrix. And it's useful for this to, to not necessarily be binary, um, because you know chances are there's some amount of error that I want to be tolerant to in, in the pairwise maths. But I'd like this thing to be correlated with the XLs, right? Because remember that the XLs are one when there's a bad loop and zero when there's not. So I do that by essentially maximizing, you can think of this as the inner product between the rows, which are just these constants saying how bad I think the loops are, and um, the, X, uh, the XLs here. Okay. And now I add these two constraints to my problem. And I need one more constraint, which is that everything is either 0 or 1. But there's a problem, which is, of course, this constraint is hard to work with. This is a binary constraint, which is not convex. Everything else is convex. So anyway, in this old CVPR paper, what they do is you relax this particular constraint to just be a weaker constraint, which is that x is between 0 and 1, rather than x is binary. This is a little bit weird. Now we don't have binary variables, but it does give us an upper bound for our problem. We optimize that, and then maybe you just round the xls and the xes, and it turns out this is a pretty effective technique for detecting inconsistent loops and inconsistent edges by just reading off the binary variables xl and xe. So this is one of the early algorithms for detecting inconsistent loops, and it's a pretty nice trick for essentially taking these noisy variables, rho l, which is telling us how different loops, how inconsistent different loops are, and then essentially trying to round them off into xls and explain them using xes. So hopefully this model makes some sense, and I think it's an easy one to implement at home. Uh, apparently, oftentimes, this linear program does lead to binary variables, xl and xe, which is cool. It means you got the global optimum, but it doesn't have to, at least the way we've written it here. So there have been all kinds of interesting extensions of this basic idea that, you know, if you have a big collection of maps, then your goal is to identify the, the bad apple, you know, that somehow, you know, if I have, a, you know, here's our, maybe I have nine shapes in my data set of models and a bunch of different maps where every edge here is a map and every vertex is a shape, you know. And so now I can compose in cycles and say like, ah, oh, this cycle more or less gave me identity, 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 not the identity. So now I think that the bad mapping is one of these two edges. This logic was extended in lots of clever ways that went beyond this original linear program, which is just trying to sort of explain cycle consistency using um, individual edge labels. One of the interesting techniques out there that I thought I'd point you all to, it's a fun read, especially for 
I think algorithm style students that are used to thinking discreetly um, was this paper, which was an optimization approach to improving collections of shape maps. And one of the earliest um, sort of sh consistent correspondence algorithms uh, out there. I think they maybe don't get as much credit as they should. Um, and this paper identified another kind of interesting challenge in the consistent mapping universe, which also underscores how weak a condition consistency is. And this is the idea that you can have an inaccurate but consistent set of maps. So for example, let's say that I have a data set of three humans. You know, so here's one, here's another, and here's a third. You know, maybe this is me and your TAs, Paul and David. Uh, and I can make a completely consistent set of maps that is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, um, maybe you know, here's the what the right hand of this uh, character here, and for whatever reason, it gets mapped to the left hand, and then this gets mapped to the right hand. And I compute all the different pairwise maps, and they're all consistent with this picture, where for some reason, this middle character was flipped left right. Notice that this is perfectly consistent, right? Everybody is mapping into the middle guy while you know, flipping the left and right hand sides by accident. But it's not accurate. It's not the map that we would actually desire. And so essentially, this sort of theme was explored in this research paper to try and identify like, what does it mean for a collection of maps to be almost accurate? Meaning that like, if I have some edge which flips left to right, then I can't have any other edge that flips left to right nearby that sort of cancels it out. And the idea here is that if I have a collection of maps that is almost perfect, but then there's just like one outlier edge, I'm much more likely to be able to detect that outlier edge than if I have a, map, a collection of maps with many different inaccurate edges that are all going in and out of the same shape. And so anyway, the, the basic idea here is that under a condition called almost accuracy, which has to do with essentially there never being two bad maps in the same cycle of three shapes. <laughs> so I can never have this property where I like flip and then unflip. Um, in that case, you can basically use a linear programming approach similar to the previous slide to detect bad maps by doing cycle consistent style computation. And then how do you fix them? Well, you just throw away the bad map uh, and replace it with the composition around a cycle. So for example, if the map this way were bad, then I could replace it with the map that goes you know, here and then here. Uh, and so essentially what goes on in this algorithm is they just keep iteratively repairing isolated inaccurate maps, which you detect by finding bad three cycles. And then you throw away the inaccurate map and you replace it with an accurate one by just composing in the other way around. Um, and it turns out that this style of strategy can be effective but you have to put some very careful mathematical conditions on your set of maps in order for that to be true. Namely that, again, your bad maps are kind of isolated from one another. So I'll let you guys do a little bit more reading to learn more about this technique. I think it's a really clever sort of algorithmic strategy and it predated some of the really heavy duty techniques that are more popular today. Now for fun, I thought I'd also highlight some work that's a little bit less theoretically oriented and a little more practically oriented. And I think in the history of consistent correspondences, one of the early techniques out there that really tried to make some practical progress was something called fuzzy correspondences or fuzzy mapping. Um, now, as usual, I don't understand this. YouTube embedding works fine until I get into this classroom here. Oh, that's too bad. Um, well, I'll encourage you guys to watch the uh, video related to this particular research paper from home. Or actually, oh, I know what the issue is. Ah, here we are. Okay, so fuzzy correspondences was a technique that did exactly what it sounded like. Essentially, uh, the, the high-level idea here was just to extract at least a fuzzy notion of consistent mapping within a big collection of shapes. So they had a user interface that looks something like this. So you maybe mark a region of interest or an ROI on one surface, and then it pulls up the closest related shapes and a little bit of an explanation of why they were related. Like you can see this blue color. So the user has painted on the bottom of one of these chairs an interesting blue region and it's pulled up some other ones. Let's see another example here. Give it a minute. 
So here's 86 airplanes in our data set. Sorry, we're interacting quite slowly here. Um, maybe we can fast forward a little bit. Right, so the user zooms in on the shape, paints a region of interest, and notice that the same region pops up on all the other shapes. So this was a very simple example of consistent correspondence that wasn't aiming for precision, right? I mean, they didn't like mark individual points and show where they go from one shape to another, but at least kind of gives you some fuzzy explanation of why it thought different regions on different objects are related, and in some cases in pretty abstractly related collections of shapes, which is pretty cool. It's a little surprising that this retrieval works as well as it does. Now, it turns out that hiding behind this is a really simple algorithm that more or less resembles some of the computations we've already done here. The basic idea is you have a big collection of shapes, and you think of each shape as a collection of k points, right? So you have n shapes and k points. So you can make a giant, giant matrix, which is nk by nk, which is the similarity between every pair of points on every pair of shapes. Now, there's an interesting computational question here, which is how do you cope with this in practice? And I think it's actually quite hard. But um, in principle, you can construct such a matrix. And essentially all they did was use the spectral embedding of this matrix, something that we covered many weeks ago, to more or less identify when points should be close by. Um, so in other words, when one point on one shape is somehow close to another point on another shape, and that's exactly what they did. They just used the top eigenvectors of this big matrix uh, as sort of a descriptor for every point or feature. And these fuzzy values, those like blue highlights that you were seeing on the shape, is nothing more than e to the minus difference between those uh, uh, shape descriptors. So in any event, this fuzzy correspondence paper was like a clever idea for really efficient shape retrieval with some explainability, right? Some consistency between, you know, showing you where those highlighted regions are going from one shape to another, and it's quite successful in practice. Now, if you continue to follow the history of segmentation algorithms, they move forward and, and considered many different problems. Oops, uh, the history of, of, of consistent mapping problems, rather. And one of them was segmentation. Um, so shape segmentation is a problem that we've covered a little bit. We talked about clustering. One thing that you might do is have a whole collection of shapes and ask that they get segmented consistently when this idea was first proposed back in 2011 in this joint seg shape segmentation with linear programming paper. You notice there's a lot of common authors in this set of papers, which is pretty common uh, for a given research direction. So here is the basic motivation behind this joint segmentation research. This was due to Huang and, and, and collaborators. But oftentimes having a collection of shapes can give you a lot of clues as to segment, how to segment any one of them. And essentially, there are many different filters that can happen when you start adding cycle consistency as a regularizer. So for example, on the left-hand side, we see a pair of eyeglasses with sort of an extraneous geometric clue. Like for whatever reason, the person who modeled this pair of eyeglasses put this like little neck in the middle of the leg of the glasses, which is actually not a particularly useful feature for segmenting the legs from the eyes of these glasses. And so in essence, we can use the fact that you don't see this feature on other shapes to improve the segmentation of the shape on the top and the bottom. So in other words, we go from the left to the right here. Right on the left, we see these extraneous blue and red features that should probably be linked together. And on the right, those are fixed by adding cycle consistency. A similar issue that can be fixed with cycle consistency is saliency. So uh, here's kind of a funny example with this data set of teddy bears. And probably a reasonable segment that you would all agree is one that we should have in any good teddy bear model would be to segment the ears from the rest of the head. But some teddy bear's ears are larger than others. And in fact, this teddy bear on the left here suffers from ears that are so close to the head that they actually don't get segmented. They just get segmented with the rest of the head, right? They're green. So somehow in the context of the collection of teddy bears, including ones with larger ears, this joint segmentation tool is able to figure out that this poor teddy bear with small ears still has important ears as features that should be marked. And then finally, one more motivation here. 
uh, has to do with rigid invariance. So for example, in automatic segmentation algorithms, you probably want to segment the upper leg from the lower leg of your 3D characters. And this guy on the right, whose leg is kind of behind him, he's making one of these poses, it's really obvious where to do that segmentation, right? Like right at the knee to separate the thigh from the lower leg. But this other character, who is just standing straight up with their arms out, from a geometry perspective, has no knees or elbows, right? They're just like straight cylinder, all the way from the top to the bottom. And so what can happen is that shape segmentation fails for this straight cylinder pose shape because there's no useful geometric clue telling you where to segment the top and the bottom. So once again, by using consistency, this uh, consistent segmentation tool is able to figure out that even though these characters with straight legs don't have interesting geometric features at their knees, probably we should separate them anyway. So the actual algorithm here, I think, has been superseded a number of times, but the motivation is really nice. To give you some idea just for fun of what goes on inside of this particular research paper, essentially they start out by calling randomized cuts, which is another algorithm that we already talked about for sort of generating a superset of the uh, segmentations you might want for a 3D model. So you just like kind of randomly keep segmenting this model over and over again and keeping all of the different possible segments you might want. And then they solve an optimization problem that has a bunch of pretty natural terms. Essentially, you're looking for every point on every surface to be covered by one segment. Uh, you don't want the area of the segment to be too big, so maybe that's another term. But the important term, of course, for our discussion today is a consistency one. And the way that these folks choose to do it is pretty similar to the, the fuzzy maps paper we talked about before. They compute fuzzy mappings between pairs of surfaces that allow things like many to one um, mappings here. And then they sort of say like, if this segment on this shape gets used, and this region, on a particular region of the surface, and this region gets mapped over here, you know, then a similar uh, set of points should be segmented together on that other shape. And so you can write that as a useful linear programming condition. And what it leads to is a multi-way joint segmentation problem that says, I'm going to choose out a subset of this overdetermined set of segments by choosing the set that is most consistent with these pairwise mappings. So in any event, I don't think it's worth covering the details here. I'll let you guys read this research paper. Um, but it was one of the interesting early ideas and triumphs of consistent correspondence. The, the basic idea here being that you can extract, in this case, a nice optimal set of co-segmentations um, that makes sense across the entire collection. OK. So for the last part of our discussion today, I thought I would cover one of the sort of state-of-the-art pieces of theory when it comes to the consistent mapping problem that I think is a really fun way to think about some of the constructions here. And the basic question that it sets out to answer is, can you construct a set of consistent maps in a globally optimal way? Now, in particular, the problem that we're going to consider is the problem of inputting a collection of maps and then finding the closest projection of that collection of maps into one that is cycle consistent. And we've already seen that many variations of this problem are likely NP-hard, but there is a technique that appears to work in practice and actually has some statistical guarantees that I think is really fun to call out and, and at least briefly introduce. So the first thing that we have to do is to more carefully define what we mean by map in this particular context. Um, in order to write down a sort of well-posed computer science uh, style problem here. And in particular, we're going to work with maps just between discrete domains. So we're going to think of a map as a permutation matrix. And moreover, we're going to think of, just for simplicity, every uh, object in our collection as, collect as being composed of the same number of points. Okay, so if I have a map collection, then I can think of that like a big collection of permutation matrices. So like maybe I have 100 humans, and every human has sampled 200 points on them, right? So then I have 200 times 100 as the size of my matrix, and each 200 by 200 block is a map from one human to the other. And it's just going to look like a permutation. So I'm not going to allow for like fuzzy mapping or anything else. i got to commit. And the reason why this makes our problem a little bit easier is that the inverse of a map then, like the inverse of a permutation matrix, hopefully you guys remember this one. Well, permutation matrices have orthogonal columns. That's easy to check. So their inverse is just their transpose. Yeah. 
And so that's going to be kind of nice from an optimization perspective. We're not going to have to deal with um, matrix inverses. So the basic problem we're going to consider is that we have a giant matrix whose blocks are permutations between every pair of shapes. And now we want to find the closest projection of that matrix onto the set of matrices that represent consistent mappings, pairwise. So, uh, and we're going we're gonna to do that just for permutation matrix style mappings. This is sometimes called the permutation synchronization problem. Now, there's going to be one useful relaxation here, which is going to let us uh, go from discrete to real valued problems, which is always handy. Um, which actually also appears in optimal transport, by the way, uh, which remember we talked about a while back. And this is to relax from permutations to a different set of matrices, which are called doubly stochastic. So a doubly stochastic matrix has all non-negative entries, so it's a non-negative you know, matrix. And it's rows sum to one, and it's columns sum to one. You can see that illustrated on the slide here. So you can think of a permutation as a doubly stochastic matrix. That's easy to check. It's sort of like a chess game, right? Every row and column of a permutation matrix can have exactly one in it and the rest zeros. That necessarily makes it doubly stochastic. But the set of doubly stochastic matrices is, is, is larger than that. So essentially, the integer value doubly stochastic matrices are permutations. If that sentence didn't parse, I encourage you to pause this video for a minute and stew it over, because I, I think it's one of these things that's easy to convince yourself, but might take a minute the first time you see it. OK, so here's going to be the basic setting of our problem here. We're given n objects. Sorry, I've, I've changed the variable letters a few times in today's lecture. And each object is sampled with m points. OK, so what does that mean? That means I have a big collection of m by m permutation matrices, which I've gotten that are essentially computing every mapping from every shape into every other one. And now my goal is to approximate this collection of mappings with a set that is consistent. OK, so let's add a little bit of detail here. The first thing is just to add some nice notation to our problem. Now, unfortunately, this is going to be where essentially no matter what, <laughs> Uh, it's going to happen, like, our, our job is just going to be a little bit annoying notationally. Uh, this is probably why category theory is so annoying to think about, too. Um, but here's going to be the um, basic sort of notation that we'll use in our discussion today. I've got my notes handy to make sure I get it right. So here's one thing. Uh, so first of all, we can take all of these uh, mappings, and we can think of this as a mapping from, from I to J. So like. We're going to use this notation phi i j, where we're going to think of phi i j as a mapping from shape i into shape j. Notice that this notation is going to be a little bit annoying because when we compose, it's going to go from like right to left or something. But we'll, we'll try to be careful with it. And since our mappings in this case are just permutations, we can combine them all together into one giant x, which we're going to say is the uh, matrix of all the possible maps. And OK, so what does that mean? That means that like the blocks of x, the m by m blocks of x, are the mapping between every pair of shapes. So overall, we can think of x as being in the set of binary values, the nm by nm. And this thing has two properties that are, we're going to say define what it means to be a mapping matrix. Uh, the first one is that it has is binary. The second, well, OK, so I guess three properties, really. The first is binary. The second one is that the diagonal is equal to a bunch of identities. So in other words, the mapping from a shape into itself is just the identity matrix. And then the third one is that all of the blocks, like the, uh, what, the m by m blocks, because remember that m is the number of points on a shape, are doubly stochastic. Oops, doubly. And so we're going to say that this is uh, what defines a pairwise map matrix.
Okay. So in general, you know, X will be our whole matrix of every possible uh, pair here. Um, and now we can say that like xij is going to be just one of these blocks, which is a permutation matrix that goes from i to j. It's going to be really easy to get things in their transposes screwed up, but I'll, I'll try to keep it straight <laughs> today. Hopefully we'll, we'll make it to the end of today's lecture without catastrophic mathematical uh, failure here. <laughs> okay, so our input matrix is an X that satisfies these kinds of things, but it may not be consistent, meaning that I may be able to multiply these X blocks in a cycle and not get the identity back out. Okay, so um, by the way, uh, so XIJ is gonna be the permutation matrix corresponding to the map phi IJ. Um, so just to keep our matrix multiplication kind of straight here, Remember that multiplication goes from, from right to left, so if I have points on the right-hand side, <laughs> like a vector of values on shape i, then they would go in like that, and then when you apply xij, then they become a vector of values on shape j. Just to, to, to keep our, ourselves honest here. Uh, and, and just so that we remember all our notation, remember there's n objects and m points sampled per object. Sorry, I'm doing some bookkeeping here just so that it's all persists when we start doing math. Okay. So if we wanted to add a little bit of notation given those letters, then a fancy way to say it is that the diagonal, ah, the diagonal blocks of x, I'm sorry, your instructor is very sleepy today. That should be an x. Uh, are going to be the m by m matrices. Okay. Now, here's an interesting question that you can ask about this giant matrix X, this big X. That is, what is the rank of the matrix big X? Now, initially, you might think, well, I mean, the big X here, it's just com it's composed of a bunch of different permutation matrices, so somehow it feels like it should be full rank, right? I mean, there's an awful lot of ones <laughs> in the columns of this matrix, so maybe the default answer is, oh, the rank should be n times m, because it's an nm by nm matrix. But now, let's say that I put a condition on that matrix X, namely, I tell you that it comes from a collection of consistent mappings. I'm going to pause for a minute here and let you think about it. What should be the rank of our matrix in that case? Well, it turns out that we can use a little bit of a hint to help us get some intuition here. So let's have a big collection of birds, you know, blue birds, yellow birds, big birds. Um, and I think about the, the mapping here. Now, if all of my maps are completely consistent, then one thing I can always do is compose around cycles, right? So if I want to get a map from any bird to any other bird, here's a way that I can do it. I can map all the birds to any one bird in the collection and then back out. And I'm guaranteed that that technique is going to give me a consistent set of maps, right? So in other words, right, I can get a phi ij by always going like phi i1 and then phi 1j, right? And that's always perfectly fine. So it turns out that that style of reasoning actually implies something about the rank of our matrix, and we can write it as follows, which is that, okay, if I have a consistent map collection, then, well, if I want to map from i to j, I can always map from i to 1, and then from 1 to j. And so that's this expression that I've written on the left-hand side, that xij is equal to xj1 transpose times xi1. Remember that xj1 transpose is the same as x1j. So, in other words, I can actually write a low rank factorization of the full matrix big X by taking this expression on the left-hand side and stacking it together a bunch of times. So here, I uh, have written a, a big column matrix of the, the identity, basically all the different maps that go into um, shape one. And essentially, the expression on the right-hand side is saying that I can write all of the maps in my consistent map matrix X by writing them as a map into shape one and then back out. And what does that mean? It means that actually, the rank of X, if I'm consistent, is not equal to N times M. The rank of, of a consistent 
x is just equal to, well, the number of columns in the factor on the right-hand side of our expression here, which is m, the number of points. And that makes perfect sense. The basic point here is that all I need are all the maps into one shape and back out. I don't need every single possible pair, and that's what's giving us our low rank factor, or our m here. So now we're going to do a tiny bit of math. I thought we'd prove just one of the initial lemmas in this research paper, just to, for fun to give you a flavor of the kind of math that we're going to do. The basic point here is that if I have this binary map matrix, so it satisfies these three conditions that I've written on the screen here, I wrote them down in anticipation of needing them in our kind of queue as we do some math here, then it turns out that there's actually three different equivalent conditions for cycle consistency. The first one is being cycle consistent, and I've written that at the top of the slide here, which is to say I have a collection of maps and actually, in this case, we're going to say that a collection of maps is cycle consistent if it is cycle consistent on just cycles of length one, namely a map from a shape to itself, cycles of length two, like i to j, and then j to i, then cycles of length three, like i to j, j to k, and k to i. And it turns out, um, actually, if you look back at that Nguyen paper that we talked about before that tries to identify isolated bad maps, they prove that under some weak assumptions, that's actually sufficient for consistency. So again, um, to echo this little tiny definition on the slide here, we're going to say that a collection of maps is consistent if it satisfies three properties. One is phi i i is equal to the identity. The second one, is, and this is, by the way, the, all of these are for like for all i, j, and k. The other is that phi j i composed of phi i j is equal to the identity, again, for all i and j. The idea here being, if I map from i to j back to i, I should get identity. And then 3 is phi k i composed of phi j k composed of phi i j is equal to the identity. So this is just saying that I'm consistent on cycles of length 1, 2, and 3. It turns out that these three conditions are sufficient for uh, consistency of on cycles of, of longer length under a few additional assumptions, which, if you remind me, I'll give you some pointers on Piazza to, to where to read about this more. But for now, we're going to call this thing um, the condition for being cycle consistent. All right. But then it turns out that there's actually three different conditions that are the same. So one is I have a cycle consistent set of maps. Here, each phi is expressed with one of the blocks of x. The second condition is that x can be written as this low rank factorization we had on the previous slide. And those two conditions are pretty obviously equivalent. It's the third one, which is remarkably surprising. And like when I read this paper the first time, even though it actually came from the lab where I did my PhD, I remember thinking like, Pew! like this is crazy, what the heck? Which is to say, the second condition here is really just saying that x is, is rank m. And we sort of convinced ourselves that a rank m collection of permutations really should correspond to something consistent. The third condition just says that x is a semi-definite matrix. And this is where things are so surprising, that this binary semi-definite matrix with doubly stochastic blocks is necessarily rank m and, and satisfies these cycle consistency conditions. And this is like mind-blowing. Let me get excited about this some more. This is super cool, because what it means is that the hard part of this mapping problem is not actually the rank constraint, which is actually really uncommon in semi-definite programming, which, spoiler alert, is going to be the tool that we'll use here. What's hard is just basically the binary constraints, which is super uncommon. Okay, so let's actually prove uh, that these three conditions are equivalent, assuming that we have a matrix which is binary, whose diagonal is identity, and whose m by m blocks are doubly stochastic. And the slides contain a pointer to the original paper with this proof. Okay, so we'll stick that in the corner here. I'm going to try to remember to leave this math alone. So the first thing that we're going to do is prove a bit of a mysterious lemma that we're going to see is going to be useful in our proof. I actually don't have great intuition for how the authors came up with this lemma. If any of you has a good suggestion of how I should think about it, let me know. We're just going to prove it formally. So here's going to be our lemma. We're going to say, suppose that x is a real number. And so then we're going to write essentially two equivalent conditions. 
One is I'm going to construct a very particular three by three matrix, which looks like the following. One by one, 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 x, one, x, one. I want to say, suppose that this is semi-definite matrix. It turns out that this is an equivalent condition to x equals 1. So like the only matrix where we have mostly 1s, and I'm just trying to fill in one additional ent entry, which is also 1, this matrix can only be salient definite if that one missing entry is equal to 1. And these are actually equivalent conditions. So that arrow goes both ways. So first, uh, let's uh, prove the easy direction, which is from right to left. So suppose that x equals 1. We want to show that the matrix uh, here, maybe we'll call this matrix m of x. Well, in this case, uh, m of x, well, and x is equal to 1. So really, this is m of 1, which is the matrix of all 1s, which can be factored as the vector of all 1s times 1 transpose. And this vector is, is really, uh, this, this product here is really clearly semi-definite, right? This is the, like a square. So, um, we're basically good. So the hard uh, direction is the reverse. So in other words, suppose that this matrix on the left-hand side is semi-definite for some x. Then we want to show that that x has to equal 1. I warned you this is kind of a weird lemma, but it's, it's, it's remarkably useful in, in, in consistent mapping. So it's worth proving. Well, how do we compute eigenvalues? Well, one way that you probably learned in undergrad linear algebra class is to think of eigenvalues as roots of a polynomial problem. So remember that you know a matrix being semi-definite is the same as all of its eigenvalues being non-negative, at least um, for our matrix symmetric like it is here. So suppose lambda is an eigenvalue. Well, then what do we know? We know that the following determinant is equal to 0, right? 0 is equal to the determinant of basically m of x minus lambda times the identity. OK. And what is this? This is the determinant of 1 minus lambda, uh, 1, 1. And now I have to be a little bit careful. 1, 1 minus lambda x, 1 x, 1 minus lambda. OK, now for notational convenience, what we're going to do is define uh, a new value here, which we're going to call p. And we'll essentially just say that p is going to be 1 minus lambda, just to simplify our algebra a little bit. So of course, uh, here's a condition which is that p less than or equal to 1 is the same thing as lambda greater than or equal to 0. The instructor got this wrong at least 100 times, but it's just high school <laughs> arithmetic here. Um, all right, so essentially what we want to show is that if this determinant is equal to 0, well, and we need that any root of uh, this thing, this determinant condition is, 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 is uh, non-negative, then necessarily x has to equal 1, right? That's, that's what we're trying to prove. OK. So in other words, uh, we can write the following, which is that 0 is equal to the determinant. Now we're just going to substitute p. So it's p1, 1, 1, 1 p x, 1 x p, like that. And essentially, when I tried to prove this lemma at home, like the, the research paper that, that talks about this just kind of says, it's obvious that these conditions are equivalent. I actually couldn't convince myself it was obvious, so we're going to actually do the proof just for fun. Um, OK, so what is this determinant? Well, if I expand out all my minors, then I'll get what? Uh, p times p squared minus x squared minus essentially 1 times um, p minus x plus 1 times x minus p, like that. OK, and uh, well, what is our unknown here? Well, remember that our goal here is to bound all of the eigenvalues uh, to be non-negative or equivalently to bound p, uh, any root p, by uh, 1 from above. So we need to solve for p. Um, so in particular, if I expand out this expression, it's equal to p cubed minus 2 
plus x squared times p plus 2x. Right, so like here is the uh, two x's. We've got a minus p and another minus p, so there's the minus 2. Here's the x squared next to p, and then there's a p cubed. Okay. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that all of the roots p here, which are functions of x, are, are, are going to be upper bounded by 1. So there's one easy root that you can kind of guess from this, which is if you choose p equals to x, you'll find that you get 0. <laughs> On the right-hand side, I'm going to let you guys check that at home. So in other words, p equals x um, is a root. When I say a root, what I mean is a choice of p that makes this expression 0 given x. OK? So what does that mean? So remember that we need p to be less than or equal to 1, because we need all of the eigenvalues of our matrix to be greater than or equal to 0. So if p equals x is a root, then necessarily we know that we have to choose x is less than or equal to 1, right? Because p is less than or equal to 1. OK. But we also need the other two roots also to be uh, upper bounded by 1. So we've got to find our other two roots. And now, here's the thing. <laughs> I tried for a long time to come up with a clever way to do this argument, and I couldn't. So we're going to take the sledgehammer approach here, and we're going to do polynomial long division. Do you guys remember this one from uh, high school algebra class? I recently, you know, I've, I tutor in Somerville Public Schools, uh, and they were doing polynomial long division, and I remember it being really, like, really painful. So in any event, what I need to do is take this expression here and divide it by p minus x, because that's one of the roots. Okay, so let's actually just do that real quick. OK, let's, let's see here. Um, let's see if I can cut out a little bit of space on the board for myself, like that. OK, so again, my goal here is to take this expression, which is p cubed. And now we're going to give ourselves a space plus 0p squared minus 2 plus x squared p plus 2x, and I need to divide it by p minus x. <laughs> um, in order to find the other two roots. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's go ahead and do this just for fun. So you remember how to do polynomial long division? I certainly didn't. So the first thing I need to do is cancel out that p cubed. I've got a p here. So I'm going to put p squared up here. So what do I get? I get p cubed minus xp squared, and I have to subtract that off. So I get um, xp squared minus 2 plus x squared p plus 2x. I keep checking my notes because I really don't want to make a mistake. OK, I have an xp squared that I need to cancel out. I got a p here. So I'm going to choose xp. You know? Um, to cancel that out. Okay, so what do I get? So now I have xp squared minus x squared p. So when I subtract this, xp squared goes away, minus x squared p goes away, and what I'm left with is minus 2p plus 2x. Okay, well, conveniently, I have a minus 2p, I have a p, so there should be a minus 2. Okay, and then that's going to be, you know, minus 2p plus 2x. I subtract that off, I get 0. Aha, so my long division worked out. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean? That means that I just managed to convince myself that this can be factored as follows. I can factor it as p minus x times p squared minus, oops, plus xp minus 2. OK. So let me erase a little bit so I've got some space. OK, so now that we have this factorization, we're almost done. But we still need to separate out the other two roots. But now we just have a quadratic, so we can notice that the remaining roots uh, 
are easy to write. And again, remember we're solving for p, not x here. So we can write p is equal to negative x plus or minus, so it's what? Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is going to be x squared, minus 4ac, so that's plus 8, over 2a, uh, and a in this case is just that. And so remember that all three roots p of this determinant need to be upper bounded by 1, right? That's, that's, that's the condition that we need uh, here. Okay, so here's the deal. We already know that x is less than or equal to 1. <laughs> um, what do we know? Well, what do we, well, let's think about this for just a second. So here's the little piece of logic that we're going to need. So clearly, the only root that matters here that we need to upper bound by 1 is the larger of the two roots. If that's upper bounded by 1, then the smaller one is 2. And essentially, what you can convince yourself is suppose that x is less than 1 strictly. Well, what's going to happen? So when x is equal to 1, I have a minus 1 here. And then I have 1 squared plus 8, so that's 9. Square root of that is 3. So this is 3 minus 1 is 2, divided by 2 is 1. So, okay, you're fine when x is equal to 1. If x is less than 1, what's going to happen here? Well, you'll get a factor of x here, but here you'll get the square root of x squared plus 8. And if you think about it, this value has got to be bigger than the minus x. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, what you're going to see is that uh, you, you end up with a contradiction here. Namely, uh, that, that, that essentially, um, yeah, when the, uh, when, when the x is less than or equal to 1, you're going to get that p has to be greater than 1, and that would be bad news. <laughs> And so, in effect, what you can conclude is that x has to equal 1 after uh, borrowing from this condition, which we already knew. OK, so that's our, our, our basic argument here. Um, and essentially, what it leads us to is this nice little lemma, which says that as long as this matrix is semi-definite, then x must equal 1. OK, so let's clear out. Okay, so remember our actual task here is to prove this equivalency that I've placed in the upper right of our uh, slide here. And really, that has to take place in three steps. That we want to show that a cycle-consistent map is equivalent to being able to factor it, as in number two, and that this third condition um, is also equivalent, which is just that x is semi-definite. And again, in all three of these, we're assuming these three bullet points I've left on the left-hand side. So what we're going to do is prove this in a number of different steps. Now, the first step is that 1 implies 2. We've actually already argued this, right? That if you have a cycle-consistent set of maps, then necessarily you can write that as basically mapping all everything into, the, for example, the first shape and then back out. Um, so I think this one's pretty easy. We're just going to go ahead and skip that. Now, let's prove that 2 implies 1. This is kind of an annoying calculation to do, so we'll do part of it. Now. Essentially, what do we have to do? We need to show that if I have a matrix X, which is binary, has doubly stochastic blocks, diagonal identity, then it satisfies, um, and it satisfies this condition number two, then it's necessarily cycle consistent, meaning that I have to check these three conditions that we've written on the, uh, the left here. So let's do that. So um, assumption number one is true by assumption, or sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, item number one is true by um, assumption, right? Because essentially one of the assumptions that we put on x is that its diagonal is the identity. So there, there's nothing to show for number one. Now, okay, in order to check this composition, what do we have to do? Well, we know that the map phi ij, right, is really given by, um, in, so remember we can assume two and we're trying to prove one. So if we assume two, then what do we know? We can map into 1 and then back out. So we can do from 1 to j composed with um, 
i to one, right? That's essentially what we're going to write. Okay, so what do we need to check? We need to check that phi i j composed with phi j i is equal to the identity. So it uh, looks something like this, phi i j composed with phi j i. Let's write this as a giant matrix product. So by item number two here, what do we know? That phi i j is really phi i1, phi 1 j, right? Um, or the other way around, because sorry, it goes from i to j. That's why I hate this notation. So it's really x1 j x i1. Hopefully you see that. So the, essentially remember that, that item number two here is saying I can always get a map by mapping into one and back out. So I want to go from i to j. I do that by doing from i to one followed by from one to j. I'm going to keep like saying these words because I feel like it's easy to get confused here. Okay, and then similarly to go from j to i, it goes the other way around. So here, now I'll have one i and x um, j one. Okay. So now, um, if we look at this product here, uh, I'm going to factor it a different way and group these two terms together. So this is the map from i to one and the map from one to i. Uh, and, and already what we've uh, essentially written because of our low rank condition is that these two guys have to give me the identity matrix, right? Because essentially I can write this whole thing as phi i j uh, transpose, which means in particular that um, the inverse of going from i to one is going from one to i. So these, these two are, are just inverses of one another. That comes from this diagonal condition here. So this inner con thing is just the identity. In some sense, by the way, um, well, never mind. Yeah. So uh, right. So this is the same as now x one j x j one. Then by the same argument, this is the identity again. So the, the basic uh, trick here is, which almost feels tautological, and it's it's darn close to being tautological, but not quite. So if I want to go from i to j, then this is, well the same as going from i to 1 and then from 1 to j, right? That's condition number 2 in essence. By the way, the fact that I can like flip these two guys uh, and, and just transpose is really given by this, this uh, diagonal is equal to identity plus this condition. So what do I do? Well, if I want to compose these maps, then I just multiply those two matrices together. So I multiply the first two and the second two. I group the ones in the middle, and I know that these have to give me the identity. And why is that? Well, I kind of fudged it a little bit, but really the idea here is that you can think of this as a diagonal block of this uh, set of y's here, right? Like the, uh, and so because this is a diagonal block and we already know that the diagonal is equal to the identity, then really this is just i. And then now we get exactly the same expression with j and we get the identity again. Okay, so three, what do we have to do? Well, this is even more annoying. So it's phi k i composed with phi j k composed with phi i j. And I think you guys can all fill in the same argument. Essentially, you're just going to do three of these pairs. right? So for example, phi k i is going to be what? Well, I have to go. So this is from k to i, right? So from from k to 1 and then 1 to i. <laughs> then similarly here, if I'm going from j to k, then that's from j to 1 and then 1 to k. And then if I'm going from i to j, then that's from i to 1 and then 1 to j, like that. Okay, so now by the same argument, if I couple like that, these are both the identity. <laughs> and then what I'm left with is x1 i x i 1 and that is also the identity. Okay, so we've shown that conditions 1 and 2 are equivalent here and those are not the surprising part. Now really quickly we can also show that 2 implies 3 and essentially this is just the definition of being semi-definite. Um, right, so for example if I take some vector z transpose times my matrix x times z. Well, notice that I can write uh, my matrix x as uh, y transpose y, right? So this is now z transpose 
y transpose y z like that. This is the norm of y z squared, which is greater than or equal to zero for an arbitrary z. So in effect, we just verified that if condition two is true, then condition three is true. This is just standard linear algebra. So really the only hard part of this proof is going from three to two. So let's clear out some space to do that. Okay, so let's see if I can mumble my way through the last little part of our proof here. So uh, in particular, what we need to show is that uh, condition three here implies condition two. So in other words, what do we need to show? We need to show that if we satisfy these conditions on being a pairwise mapping matrix and The moreover, we assume that our pairwise mapping matrix is semi-definite, then we're going to show that those conditions alone are enough to show that it has a rank M factorization. And this is surprising. This is super surprising that this happens. I think. Let me say it a few more times. I think it's surprising. Okay. So in particular, what we're going to do is, is a little bit of arithmetic to like make our life easier. So, Let's define a very particular matrix, and we're going to call it big D. So big D is equal to a block diagonal matrix, which is identity, and then x1, 2, and then x1, 3, to x1, n. OK, so this is a diagonal matrix with m by m blocks on the diagonal. And each block is given by the map from one to all the other shapes. OK, and we're going to write a very particular matrix, which is we're going to define x prime to be equal to d times x times d transpose. Now, first of all, by the way, what is d transpose? It's the same thing as d inverse, right? And that just has to do with the same argument we've already made a bunch of times about permutations. Well, let's think about what this matrix looks like. Let's go back a few slides here. And now let's think about this slide for a second. So remember that D, I've managed to cover it up now, is basically a diagonal matrix, which is composed of the elements of the first row of, of X in this block form. So if I multiply it by D, well, so what am I going to get? Like, for example, the second row, I'm going to get X12 times X12 transpose and so on. So I get a bunch of identity matrices. So at the end of the day, if I plug into that form I had before, what I'm going to find is that my x prime has a really nice structure, which is why that we choose to do this. In particular, it's going to have identity matrices all along the first row and column. Um, so really, all the interesting stuff is happening in the lower uh, rectangle of this matrix here. Uh, and in particular, uh, just by kind of plugging this definition of D in, what we can find is that the ij block of x prime is going to equal, well, what's going to happen? I'm going to pre-multiply by D, right? So I'm going to incur an x1i when I do that. And then I have the original uh, x block, so i, j, like that. And then uh, I'm pre I post multiply by d transpose, so I'm going to get x1, j transpose. OK. And moreover, this matrix still has orthogonal blocks, and, and it still looks like it's basically still a pairwise map matrix, because all I did was multiply by more permutations. I didn't do anything too crazy. Now. All we did was take x and conjugate it with d. So because we know that x is semi-definite, I can never draw that semi-definite sign, but that's what I mean here. <laughs> then what that implies is that x prime is also semi-definite. That's, that's an easy thing to check. OK. And in particular, if a matrix is semi-definite, then one thing that we know is that the three by three principal submatrices of uh, x prime are semi-definite. 
Now, you might say like, oh my goodness, you're like breaking out the big math terms here. Um, so what is a principal submatrix? It's basically just a submatrix where like I choose out some subset of columns and rows and I uh, construct it. So for example, um, you, you, do I want to write it down? Yeah, so like for example, like let's say I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, then like one of the principal submatrices corresponding to index one and index three would kind of look like A, C, G, I, right? That would be a two by two principal submatrix of this thing. And uh, moreover, if this is semi-definite, then by conjugating with, with vectors that look like, you know, x, 0, y, you can show that this submatrix is also semi-definite. I'll let you check that one at home in case you, you, you haven't seen this fact before, but it's a pretty straightforward one to, uh, to see. Okay, so let's see if we can manage to finish off this argument. I always get this one a little wrong. Um, so I'm going to draw a slightly different schematic for our matrix x prime. So I'm going to draw little rectangles for each of its blocks, like this. And we're going to start kind of filling in information about what we know about this matrix. Okay, so we've got a bunch of little rectangles, and these are like the individual mappings which are hiding inside of the, 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 our pairwise mapping matrix that we're trying to figure out. Okay? And notice uh, from our form uh, here that the upper arrow of this matrix is a bunch of identities. So we can think of these like little diagonal matrices, right? They, they look like this, right? They're just diagonals of ones. This is a schematic picture. Now, I'm going to choose a three by three principal submatrix here, right? So this is indices i, j, k, and I'm purposefully going to choose i to be in one, two, or three. So in other words, I'm going to select out at least one of my indices to be from the first three rows or columns of our matrix. And I'm going to construct our principal submatrix. Now, I'm going to experimentally use a different color and see if we can manage to do this. So I'm going to choose i, j, or k to be in the sort of first little chunk. So, I, or rather, just i. So maybe when I choose my, my principal submatrix, that i comes from like this yellow line. And now I get to choose two more uh, j, k's from anywhere else. So like maybe I choose j to be, you know, somewhere here, you know, so I guess it's J like that, and then maybe K comes from the second row like that. Okay, so what is our three by three principal sub matrix? <laughs> so again, remember this is index, maybe I, I guess the way I drew it, this was J and this is K. That doesn't matter, the order uh, doesn't, doesn't matter a whole lot. I, J, K. Okay, so when I look at our principal submatrix, there's actually a lot that I can say about it. So what is going to be this submatrix? Well, it's three by three, so it should be an X, sorry. Like that. It's I, J, K, I, J, K, right? And this is just uh, drawn by like choosing out elements that are kind of at the intersection points of these lines that I just drew. Hopefully this schematic makes some sense. Oh, oops. <laughs> I don't know why I drew that last one. It's this point here. Okay. So, now from our picture, I'm hoping you guys are gonna see the magic trick that just happened. So, first of all, what is the ii element? Well, notice that that comes from the diagonal of the upper block so necessarily, the ii element here is 1. Ha! And moreover, in fact, let's say that I choose j and k to be just i shifted by a multiple of m. So like j is equal to i plus m, which is a number of points, times some constant integer. And similarly for k. What does that mean? So that means like if I choose like the third row here, I'm going to choose the three plus mth row or column uh, for the next one. So what does that mean? Well, that means in like for example, i j here, 
Take a look, it intersects this diagonal line. So actually, once again, I get a one because it comes from the diagonal of identity matrix. And similarly for IK. Okay, so essentially, uh, what do we know? We know that like IK, KI, IJ, JI, all of these different pieces are gonna give us a one. The only elements of our matrix that we don't know are here. So how did I get that? Well, again, from the schematic, we just noticed that we sort of intersected the diagonal of these identity matrices in exactly the right space. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, how did I fill in the one in the middle here? Uh, well, I got it just from the condition of being a map matrix, that the diagonal is equal to identity. Yeah, so that's like how I know that the diagonals here are also uh, are gonna look like identity matrices. So notice I basically, all I've done here in my really ugly diagram is very carefully chosen i, j, and k so that when I choose this principal submatrix, <coughs> almost every single entry here is already known to be a one, right? I know it here, here, and here, 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 and here because it's coming from the first sort of part of my matrix, right? So that is what's giving us, um, Oops, there should be a one here. Um, so that's giving me like this piece and this piece. And then these two ones are being filled in from this diagonal is equal to the identity property, right? So that's like these two pieces here. Okay, so, well, what do I know? I know that the three by three principal sub matrices are all semi-definite. So in particular, this is a three by three th principal submatrix, so it's semi-definite. But now, by our lemma, right, this is the lemma that we proved, or at least kind of mumbled our way through, <laughs> this unknown element is equal to one. <laughs> okay, so what did we just show? We showed that this value here is actually a one. Okay, so by repeating this argument, I can actually show that the entire diagonal of every single block in this matrix is equal to one. And that's what we need because, okay, we know that the diagonal of every block um, of each uh, m by m block is a bunch of ones, that's what this argument shows, plus the lemma, right, that if I have a semi-definite three by three matrix and I'm only missing one element, and all the other elements are one, then that missing element is also a one. Well, the diagonal of every m by m is block, uh, m by m block is one, and we know that our matrix is doubly stochastic. So if we take these two facts together, what we get is that all of our blocks are actually just the identity. Okay, um, so. In other words, I can write xij prime. Let's see if we can finish off the proof in the space we have remaining here. So for all ij, the blocks here are just equal to the identity matrix. But now let's plug in our expression, right? So this is really x1i, oops, that should be an i, 1i x i, j, x, one, j, transpose. Okay, so uh, if I want to invert these two permutation matrices, then essentially what I showed is that x, i, j is equal to x, one, i, transpose, x, one, j. And that is exactly what we wanted to prove, number two. So I'll admit that my diagram here is not beautiful. So let's summarize my argument a tiny, tiny bit. I actually ended up having to use basically every piece of the puzzle here, um, which is admittedly kind of messy. So let's summarize from a high level what just happened. So essentially I said, suppose that I have a binary matrix that satisfies these three conditions. It's binary, its diagonal blocks are the identity matrix, and its m by m blocks, all of them, diagonal or not, are doubly stochastic. That's what we're gonna call a pairwise mapping matrix. But we don't know that it's consistent yet. What we do know is that our matrix is semi-definite, right? That's condition number three. Okay, so 
we have this matrix X, we defined a matrix D, which is just gonna make our arithmetic easier. And so essentially by conjugating by D, we ended up with a matrix whose first row and first, or first row and first column are all identity matrices. And moreover, we can write this nice expression for every block of our matrix X i j prime. Now, it's pretty easy to show that if X is semi-definite, then so is X prime. And if a matrix is semi-definite, so are its principal submatrices. So we chose a three by three principal submatrix really, really carefully. We chose i, j, and k indices to all correspond to the same point in different domains. And moreover, we chose i to be specifically in the first domain. So this is the schematic that you should have in mind. So, so far, what do we know? We know that our matrix has a bunch of little rectangular blocks. We know that the first column and the first row of those blocks are identity matrices. And we've just kind of drawn this grid on top of yellow lines, which is gonna select out different elements of our matrix, which are our principal submatrix. Now, we know that we have ones in the first row in the first column of our three by three principal submatrix because those come from this line and this line here. And we get ones down the diagonal as a byproduct of our second condition on the left here. And we know that this three by three matrix is semi-definite. So by applying that little lemma that we proved, we have a semi-definite three by three matrix which has almost all ones except for one missing element. Then necessarily, that missing element also has to equal one. So in other words, that submatrix is all equal to ones. Now this, plus the doubly stochastic condition we have, is sufficient to show that every single m by m block of x prime is equal to the identity matrix. That's here. So we plug that into our expression for x prime and out comes condition number two, which is exactly what we wanted. So is it a messy proof? Absolutely, but that's life in the city. And now we've managed to prove our lemma, that these three conditions are equivalent so long as our matrix X satisfies these three conditions here. Okay, so our final task is to take this lemma that we just showed, these three equivalent conditions, and basically apply it to designing a useful algorithm for consistent correspondence. And the way that we're gonna do that is to make use of the fact that condition number three here, the one that wasn't obviously equivalent to the other two, uh, is a convex condition. So here's how we can do that. Here's a problem of approximating a collection of maps by a consistent collection of maps. So here we have as input data x, i, j, n. So these are like all of our pairwise inconsistent maps. And what we're gonna try and do is cook up a uh, optimization problem for a consistent collection of maps x. So let's see if we can read through this problem. First, our objective function here is the inner product between x, i, j, n and x, i, j. And if you think about it, like, so if x, i, j, n and x, i, j are both binary matrices, then this inner product here is just counting the number of matches that are preserved. So this is not only finding me the best approximation of x, i, j, n that is consistent, where best here means that I leave as many matches as alone as possible. And now I'm gonna need a number of constraints in order to write down this approximation by consistent maps problem. I need to be binary, right? That's part of the condition to be in permutation. And in fact, uh, so these are the two doubly stochastic conditions. And so if I say I have a binary matrix, which is also doubly stochastic, then necessarily every single, uh, then, then necessarily that matrix is a permutation. And I apply this double stochasticity on every block of my matrix X. So in other words, X is a block permutation matrix. And I have two additional conditions. One is that the map from every shape to itself is just the identity. And then finally, we have this condition that X is semi-definite, which we showed is equivalent to low rank and also equivalent to consistent. So if I can solve this maximization problem, then I am guaranteed to extract out a consistent collection of permutations, which is kind of cool. This is already a really slick way to write down this optimization problem. It's only one problem, which is that this is a tough problem to solve in practice. In fact, it is non-convex thanks to this binary constraint, thanks to the very first constraint here. So we'll follow a very well-trodden strategy in numerical optimization, which is to take this non-convex constraint and relax it 
Namely, rather than asking that x be a binary value 0 or 1, we're just going to say that x is greater than or equal to 0. By the way, the two first constraints together uh, have a name. This is called a doubly positive matrix. Um, by the way, notice that I could have also upper bounded said x is less than or equal to 1, but that's sort of unnecessary thanks to the double stochastic condition. And this optimization is convex. I've gotten rid of all the non-convex part. And the optimal objective value necessarily kind of upper bounds the previous one because I relaxed a constraint. And one of the amazing things here is that oftentimes solutions to this problem, even though it's a relaxed version of the binary problem we really wanted to solve, are actually quite useful. Um, as one uh, small detail here, uh, once you get out this solution uh, x, you can round it to the closest block permutation matrix um, using a linear assignment problem. This is just a detail in this research paper. The basic idea here is that my relaxation is allowing x to take on real values. It's no longer just binaries, right? So if I get a permutation matrix with an entry that's like 0.9, I have to do something with that. And so I round it off to the closest permutation matrix, which turns out to be a well-posed problem that I can do block by block. What I can't do is guarantee that the rounding is still consistent. But it turns out that oftentimes it is. Uh, and so there's this beautiful theorem, which is actually the hard part of this research paper. We just derived the easy part in our lecture today, and I already screwed it up a little bit, which is that you can tolerate some fraction of incorrect matches in your set of mappings and still recover the globally optimal best set of consistent mappings using that relaxed problem that I wrote in the previous slide. Now here is a little bit of a detail that we didn't cover so carefully. Um, if you look back at this problem here, notice I, the sum is really over ij and e, which is a subset of pairs of uh, domains. So it turns out that you don't need a map between every single possible pair of surfaces. You can just have some subset, and that's OK. And then it actually has to do with the uh, eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian, where the graph is given by the pairs of shapes between which you have computed uh, mappings. And essentially, this gives you some fraction of matchings that can just be random noise and still recover the correct consistent set of maps. Now, this theorem is a little bit hard to read, but we know lambda 2 for complete uh, graphs. So in particular, you can have up to 25% of your matchings if, if you have every single possible map between every pair of shapes. You can have 25% of your matches be wrong um, from each sample on one shape and still recover actually the globally optimal closest consistent set of mappings. Um, so I guess here 25% incorrect means incorrect like I started with a consistent set of maps and then I just randomly um, drew some subset of, of points and, and messed with their matchings. So this is pretty amazing. What it means is that this is a really robust technique for recovering a consistent set of maps, giving a noisy, not quite consistent set of maps. And it actually works quite well in practice. So in practice, what do you do? You have this pairwise set of maps, x, i, j, n. You solve this convex problem. Then on every block, you solve another convex problem to get an actual uh, permutation matrix. And, and what comes out is more often than not a consistent set of maps. And this is just a byproduct of this really nice semi-definite condition for consistency, which is super elegant. I'll refer you guys to this research paper for all kinds of fun experiments. They actually sort of manage to show that there's a nice phase transition that happens between you know, maps with just a little bit of error, in which case you are guaranteed to recover the actual consistent subset. And then sometimes with maps with like a lot but not a ton of error, you still can, but there's no theory about that. And then finally, there's a phase transition into stuff that's so much noise, this algorithm doesn't succeed. And they can you know, solve problems on collections of shapes to get, for example, collections of humans where all of their left hands are mapped to each other, even though in the input data, every once in a while, like left hand and right hand are swapped. Now, one thing you might notice from this <laughs> figure, which is absolutely true, and a little bit disappointing is how small this example is. In particular, there's like, what, one, two, three, four, five, six times three. There's 18 shapes here, and each shape has like five or 10 points sampled on it. The reason why is that solving semi-definite programs is really difficult. So even though we have a convex formulation of this problem, um, it's still quite hard to solve in practice. And I think there's a lot of work 
uh, to be done to take this really, really elegant formulation of consistency and make it make sense or, or make it solvable at a very large scale. Um, incidentally, it's worth noting that this is not just a computer graphics problem. Actually, um, the exact same permutation synchronization problem is also considered in the machine learning literature. Um, so I'll refer you to this research paper by uh, Risi Condor and colleagues uh, that talks about it in terms of permutation synchronization, which is exactly the same problem. They use a weaker relaxation involving eigenvalue problems, which is probably more scalable but has fewer guarantees. OK, so to conclude our discussion, I think one reasonable consideration that we should have when we talk about these consistent mapping techniques is to ask where the pairwise input maps came from. Right? For example, in the algorithm we just talked about, essentially it's sort of like a cleanup routine. Right? It takes a bunch of pairwise maps between different domains and then gives you the closest projection from those pairwise maps to a consistent set of pairwise maps. But that begs the question of where do the pairwise maps come from? In an ideal universe, you wouldn't need those as input. You would just have a geometry problem and say, for this collection of objects, extract a consistent set of mappings. And there are algorithms out there that do that. In other words, do sort of an end-to-end -end version of our previous lecture in today's lecture. Um, so for example, one um, version of this maybe says, I'm going to extract my, my pairwise maps using quadratic assignment problem, and then also add these consistency conditions. So what I get is a giant quadratic assignment problem between all the points on all of the surfaces all at once. You can write this as a very humongous quadratic program and then come up with a nice convex relaxation that sort of follows a similar path to what we just derived. Or there are other sort of approximate methods out there. Like for instance, uh, this technique has a whole sequence of quadratic programs that it solves that tries to consistently match descriptors or this work, which actually was by your instructor, um, introduces a low rank factorization, but allows there to be entropy or fuzziness in the uh, mapping collection. So I think there's a lot of experimentation uh, and, and interesting ideas to be had in this uh, space. So one thing that I think is worth concluding um, with is to note that the cycle consistency idea started in geometry, but very quickly propagated its way into the computer vision literature, and actually very quickly became one of the most popular regularizers for a variety of computer vision tools. Uh, a lot of this was inspired by work called CycleGAN, um, which I thought I'd very briefly mention today, because I think it's a really fun piece of research. Um, now, the remainder of the slides in today's talk are basically borrowed from the authors. I've included the URL of their site on the bottom here. This is not work that, that I've done personally. And so the basic idea here is that the cycle consistency perspective is valuable not just for like shape matching, like the problems we've talked about so far, but also some really interesting translation problems in computer vision. So for example, maybe I want a system that inputs sketches of cats and outputs photographs of cats that are sort of conforming to the sketch. Now, there are two different ways that I might train a machine learning problem. The, or machine learning system that might solve this kind of problem. Right? So one of them would be to use paired data. So here when I say paired, what I mean is that my training data is a bunch of pairs of like a sketch of a cat and a photo of a cat. Um, and you know, if I have enough pairs, then I can directly solve a regression problem that maps from x to y's. But this is a great example of a problem where we're very unlikely to have a whole lot of pairs. Right? It's, it's very easy to download sketches of cats. It's very easy to download photographs of cats. But it's really hard to download sketches of photographs of cats. <laughs> and so that leads us to a different type of machine learning problem called unpaired translation, where I have photographs of two different sets of objects. Those are easy to obtain, but I don't have a mapping from one side to the other. So for example, here we have a bunch of horses and a bunch of zebras. What we don't have is like a horse with a zebra texture or vice versa. So our task here is to do image translation, to go from the left to the right hand side. So for example, from sketches to photos, or from horses to zebras in a similar pose. Now initially this doesn't sound a whole lot like the consistent mapping problem we've talked about, but actually it turns out they're very closely linked together. And here's how. So let's say that we use an adversarial network approach to this image generation problem. So for instance, you know, I'm trying to train a deep network that takes in a photograph of horses and outputs a similar looking photograph of zebras. Um, so the content is kind of the same, but now the texture has changed. 
Now, the way that this happens in adversarial networks is that you have two different units. You have a generator and a discriminator, which are trained in your machine learning system. The generator inputs a photograph x and outputs g of x, which is sort of like supposed to be a similar version of x, but in this new set. So like it inputs a horse, outputs a zebra. And now you have a discriminator network, which is trying to figure out the difference between real and generated photographs. So like maybe it inputs the generated zebra photo, and it outputs like yes or no, was this uh, zebra photo computer generated or was it from my data set, right? So the hope is that your generator makes very photorealistic objects, and then the discriminator is fooled, so it's a sort of minimax style back and forth problem. But an issue with this adversarial training model, which is very common in machine learning, is illustrated on this slide, which is in the unpaired case, what can I do? Well, I can generate a zebra looking image from a horse looking image, and in the top I was quite successful, right? We have two horses in the same pose uh, as, uh, being led to two zebras in, in the same pose. On the bottom, I just have an arbitrary photo of a zebra. It has nothing to do with the input data. But all our discriminator can say is that both photos on the right look like zebras. <laughs> Right? And, and so this is an issue that's known, that leads to a problem called mode collapse. The idea that like, actually a totally reasonable generator for my GAN takes all photos of horses and maps them to one photo of a zebra. And from the perspective of this adversarial training, I was successful, right? Because this thing looks like a photo of a zebra, which is what our discriminator is able to figure out. Where the discriminator doesn't know the correspondence between the left and right hand sides. All it can do is make sure that a data point on the right reasonably fits into the data distribution. So how did CycleGAN solve this problem? Well, they introduced cycle consistency, exactly the same condition that we've been applying to shapes. So here's the basic idea. Let's say that I take my photograph of a horse, and now I put it through the generator, and I get back a photo of a zebra that's supposed to be in a similar pose. I can't really evaluate that photo of the zebra particularly well because it just doesn't exist in my zebra data set. But one thing I can do is, generate, is, is train a second generator that takes photos of zebras and translates them back to photos of horses. We'll call that F. And I can compose the two together and make a cycle. So I go from X to G of X to F of G of X. So I generate a zebra from a horse and then a horse from a zebra. And what I'd like is to come up with a loss term that says, when I sort of as illustrated on the bottom here, when I go from x to y back to x here, that I close the loop. In other words, that it's cycle consistent. And in this work in computer vision, the cycle consistency that loss they use is exactly the same one that's actually used in that semi-definite program that we wrote down before, which is pretty cool. So the data generating procedure is very different. Now we're using deep networks and generators, but the loss function is the same, which is I take my photo, I translate it to the other domain, and I translate it back, and I want that those composed maps is basically identity. And so this leads to a loss function called the cycle consistency loss, which you can now add to your GAN model. So now your GAN model has two terms, right? One is that it's cycle consistent as you train these two different image translators going from left to right and right to left. And also just that the generator is making things that look like they come from the uh, data distribution. That's what the discriminator does. So when we put these together, we get some pretty cool, I don't know about state of the art anymore, but pretty close uh, image translation uh, type output. So for example, here's a horse. And when we put it through our unpaired machine learning technique, we get a zebra horse. <laughs> uh, here's another one. This is super cool. I love these slides that I've stolen from uh, the authors of this paper. I think they're really fun. Or here's an orange getting translated to an apple. Another one. Notice, by the way, that the discriminator is unable to tell the difference between foreground and background. Right? So the apple changed, but also the leaves around it did, even though that probably was maybe irrelevant. Um, you can also solve this for unpaired things, like take the complete works of an artist or a set of photographs, and then make them look like the complete works of an artist. So for example, Monet, Van Gogh, Cezanne. Um, and so in each one of these cases, because our task is unpaired, essentially all you're doing is transferring the style and preserving the content by using a cycle consistency regularizer. Now what do we do in cycle consistency? We often consider more than two shapes, and it turns out that's appeared in the computer vision as well. So they call this cross-domain models, 
where now I have Gans pointing every which way. Like maybe I have four different things, like four different artists whose paintings I want to translate between. And just like there's many different ways to think about uh, cycle consistency for shapes, you can do the same thing for generative models, right? You could map everything to an er shape and back, like on the right-hand side. That leads to a computer vision model known as Stargan. Or on the left-hand side, you have a cross-domain model that just does it on every pair, kind of similar to the SDP that we were solving. So anyway, I've talked far too much about cycle consistency, but I think it's a really fun topic. So the basic idea of consistent correspondence is that if we compute a whole collection of maps at a time, rather than just considering a single pair, we can regularize our whole collection by detecting bad maps through cycle composition. So we derived the basic condition, which we called cycle consistency, and we saw that it's related to spanning trees, right? Because a cycle consistent set of maps corresponds to a spanning tree of the graph of maps between objects. And then we talked about a few different algorithms for detecting and fixing collections of maps that are not cycle consistent, right? Starting with a linear program that just tries to attribute bad cycles to their constituent edges, and then ending with a very fancy semi-definite programming model that can actually take a collection of permutations and project it onto the closest collection of permutations that's cyclically uh, consistent, assuming that no more than 25% of the matches is bad, which is pretty miraculous. Um, we derived that method in quite some detail. And then finally, uh, we moved from theory to practice and showed that this idea, of this idea of cycle consistency is not just useful for mapping between geometric domains, but it actually had a lot of impact in the computer vision literature to train generative models that can solve unpaired tasks. So like given a data set of images that look like one thing and images that look like another, we can train a translator that tries to kind of project from one set to the other. And cycle consistency is a really critical term there. So essentially you end up with two different pieces. One is a discriminator that tries to make sure that your photos look like photos, for example. And then the other is a cycle consistency term that says, I'm going to take one image data set, translate it to the other, and then translate it back, and that that composition should be the identity. And that loss function that people are using in deep learning is identical to the one we've used in geometry for a long time. So all these tools fit together. So anyway, that's our story about consistent correspondence. It took me about two times the amount of time I anticipated and contained many arithmetic mistakes, I'm sure. But hopefully you have some idea of the flavor of this kind of research and where it gets applied.